Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Thomas. I am in the Division of Plant Sciences uh, with University of Missouri, and I'm based at the university's Southwest Research Center, uh, based at, at Mount Vernon, Missouri. So last year in 2021, uh, we, as a large group, got a major grant on American elderberry. And I'm just going to give a bit of an update about this. And we started with about 33 people on this project, and now we brought on a number of graduate students. We're probably over 40 people on the project now, so it's gotten really big. So the grant is more than $5 million. It's a USDA NEFA specialty crop research initiative grant. Uh, again, it began in September of 21 and will go through most of 2025. So a lot of partners in this besides University of Missouri, North Carolina State University is a partner in food science. Lincoln University here in Jefferson City, Missouri, uh, our entomology partners. University of Minnesota are working with our, sorry, with our group in economics. Uh, Penn State University, there's a colleague there involved in the uh, mechanical harvest and engineering, and then two nonprofit groups, the Kerr Center for Sustainable Agriculture in Oklahoma and the Savannah Institute that many of you know of in the upper Midwest. So within University of Missouri, lots and lots of partners reaching all across the College of Agriculture, as well as Health Sciences, the medical school up there. I don't need to go through all of these, uh, but uh, also University Extension. So it's quite a massive project. So I'm just going to give an overview here. So uh, one of the aspects is horticulture. And this is our greenhouse. This picture here uh, this summer was very, very full. And if you look even under the benches, you can see plants tucked under the benches. Uh, we propagated thousands of elderberries <clears throat> by cuttings and by seed. Uh, it was quite uh, quite overwhelming, uh, but the goal of most of this was to establish this, what I call a latitudinal gradient uh, horticultural trial where we had 12 genotypes of American elderberry selected from Florida to Wisconsin uh, and up to Minnesota. And then all 12 of these are planted uh, at all five of these sites, uh, Poto, Oklahoma, here at the Mount Vernon, the Southwest Center, the Hark Farm. This is a Savannah Institute farm in, in Champaign, Illinois, and another Savannah Institute farm at Spring Green, Wisconsin. So that just went in this summer, a very ambitious project, lots of work. It went very well. We had a horrible drought here in Southwest Missouri. So we just watered daily for most of the summer and things did pretty well. So, uh, and our, my student, Sydney Moore, is going to give a separate talk on the, this aspect of the project, just a three minute talk. So, she's a new grad student we brought on. So, we also established a weed management project uh, with another new grad student, Matthew Hutchteman, who many of you may know, and he's also uh, prepared a three minute talk. So, looking at different weed management options, including possible organic methods. Uh, I'll, I'll let him describe that separately. So that went in here at Mount Vernon and up at the Hark Farm. Uh, as part of uh, horticulture, uh, we have an entomology program working with Dr. Clement uh, Akotz and Mensa at Lincoln University. So we have good insects, bad insects, as well as pollinators. Uh, we also have mites that are a problem with elderberry. So a lot of effort going into that. And a new graduate student was brought on for that project as well as partially funding a postdoc. And then this coming summer, we will begin leaf tissue analysis uh, program. And uh, there's also a breeding, pr uh, breeding program. Uh, Liz Pranger will discuss this, so I won't mention very much of it here, but basically new cultivar development, genome sequencing, sequencing and a pollination biology, among other things. So I just want to throw up these pictures really quick on the breeding. So pretty much everything we've ever done here has been 
with cuttings of elderberry for asexually propagating cultivars. So we very rarely, if ever, do anything from seeds. However, Liz will explain that what one thing we're doing is open pollinated seedlings as a breeding strategy. So I was pretty nervous about how to germinate elderberry seeds. Uh, they're known to be rather difficult and require a picky stratification method. So we tried a bunch of different methods and uh, luckily uh, we figured out some. Uh, here is treatment number two. I'm not sure what the treatment was, but whatever this was, it involved cold and warm stratification, uh, had you know incredible success. And whatever treatment this was resulted in two dandelions and one little elderberry seedling here. <clears throat> So uh, very interesting how that came about. So now we pretty well know what we're doing with this, but until you try it, you really don't know. So here are some pictures from the Southwest Centers, uh, brand new planting. So on one end of this is the uh, genotype by environment study that I mentioned. And on the far end is the weed management. Like way down here is the weed management. This is the genotype by environment. There's a space between those. Um, and this is a little bit more than one acre total, so it's quite quite a project. And everything, this is earlier in the summer, uh, everything looks really good now. And over here, we did a lot of work installing brand new irrigation, quite, quite a deal. Uh, likewise, at Hark, many of you may recognize this site. This is the former vineyard site, uh, not far from the office there. <clears throat> and we installed on part of it for the genotype by environment study, we use this weed barrier fabric. Uh, on the weed management part, of course, there are many different treatments. So this was quite an effort. Uh, this is by the way, this is Matthew Hutchtabin, one of the new grad, uh, grad students. This is McKenna Thompson, who just started her master's at Missouri State University. So they all worked on the project here as undergrads. So uh, there's also a very significant mechanical harvest aspect to this project. And I'm certainly not an engineer. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but our colleague, uh, Jin Fong Zhu over in, uh, he used to be ag engineering, but now they have merged with plant science. So now we're called plant, uh, division of plant science and technology. So he's in our division. And basically these are some of his slides and pictures. They've had a really fun year uh, developing concepts for mechanical harvesting, trying a few different prototypes and just trying them out in the field. Uh, and, and a very important aspect of this is understanding how the elderberry plant presents the fruit, how stiff it is, how difficult it is to detach the berry. There, there's a lot involved in this and it's very, very interesting to see. I have a couple more pictures or several more pictures here, uh, just some various things that they've been trying. This is really cool. It's just a just an experiment. This is like basically a sawzall that they modified with a fork. Uh, and then here's a different version of this uh, because you have to shake the fruit and the plant to get the berries off. Here's an example. This is interesting. Yes, we know that an elderberry will come off the plant pretty easily but this is a device to measure the exact force needed to detach an elderberry. It seems elementary, but this is all part of the science. Over here, uh, Dr. Zhu wanted to buy this very expensive high-speed camera, which he did. So here's an elderberry branch with fruit on it and computer and recording lots of uh, things going on out in the field. And this next picture, this is some of this, but I love this slide here. These are some sort of algorithms where the computer is detecting a cluster of elderberry fruit. So I guess it could be harvested. So there's more that they're doing. It's very interesting work, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's a very significant economics component to the project and Kelsey Stubblefield, that you all know has taken over most of the work that Dr. Jen Kai was doing. Uh, Jen was a very important person in this grant, but as you know, she's left. This is where the University of Minnesota group comes in, a really, really strong partnership. 
So there are several aspects. Uh, let me also mention Dr. Teo Skavas over in the Division of Applied and Social Sciences, a part of CAFNR, is also very, very important in this economics uh, aspect. So the, we want to understand the entire value chain from field to consumer. Uh, and Kelsey has just sent out, I'm, I'm sure she'll be talking about this, she just sent out a major Qualtrics consumer research survey to 1,000 people. And she's got the data back and compiling that. Uh, Dr. Scavis, who I mentioned, is working on the production system economics. Uh, now, Dr. Kai, Jen Kai, had worked on, on an elderberry support tool, and hopefully Kelsey can pick that up and revise that. Marketing strategies, and then another aspect is this FBMA, Farm Business Management Association, which I don't fully understand, but it's a bit of a training program for a select group of farmers. This is all ongoing. <laughs> and the food science and brain health aspect is very interesting, and it's really taken off this year. So uh, new product development, uh, dietary supplement research. So the, basically, we've started, uh, when you see these, this picture here, with spray drying elderberry juice. So this, this is pure elderberry juice uh, that has been spray dried. And, the, and our partner here at Mizzou is Dr. Kiruba Krishnaswamy, who many of you know. So over in her lab in food science and engineering, they've done this where they've, they've tried uh, different carriers. So I guess the elderberry juice by itself can be sticky and gummy even after it's spray dried. So here is an example with tapioca starch. Here is an, exa uh, an example with this is SPI is soy protein isolate. So these things help keep it beautiful and powdery and useful. So there's quite a bit of research going on in, in developing that and kind of perfecting it. Meanwhile, the folks at North Carolina State are really scaling this up in, in an industrial manner. So it's very interesting. And ultimately part of this research is going to spin into beginning this winter uh, mouse studies on brain health, where these freeze-dried powders are going to be uh, forming part of a mouse diet, and there will be mice with and without elderberry. And then to make it more complicated, this DHA, which is a very popular dietary supplement, omega-3 fatty acid, is going to be uh, used with and without elderberry. So the the hypothesis is that elderberry is good, DHA is good, but in combination, those two will be really good and really symbiotic with each other. And this is all aimed at brain health. So memory loss, uh, aging brain, even Alzheimer's. So it's very interesting. This mouse study is starting this winter. Many, many partners uh, in chemistry and the health sciences department We'll be working on that. And then finally, uh, the, the project does have a significant outreach component. So one of our big events in last June was our big annual meeting. So we had a grant meeting where we, where we brought our, our grant team together. People came in from North Carolina, Minnesota, uh, and we had even farmers visiting from Chile uh, from Canada came down. And what happened is we we took the opportunity and we piggybacked this meeting with the big elderberry growers meeting, which is usually held every June. So we had the scientists here the first day. Uh, a few of the growers are on, on our stakeholder advisory board. So they attended part of the scientific meeting. And then since the scientists were here, they presented the first day of the grower meeting, which was really interesting. A lot of great talks on economics, food science, everything you've heard here today. So it was very successful, I think. Um, and we're going to do it again this June. I don't have the date here, but it's in the middle of June. So uh, field days, uh, several of these five sites I mentioned were having field days. We'll be presenting at various conferences, such as the Great Plains Growers Conference. Um, 
so grower guides, we have, we produced an elderberry grower's, grower's guide a few years ago. It, it needs updating. And we're going to be developing an online training curriculum basically on growing elderberries. It'll be a series of, of talks like establishment and fertilizing and irrigation, these kind of things that can be archived and made available to anybody. And we, we are pretty excited about that. We think it'll be very useful. We developed a brand new website for the project. Here's the, here's the address. It's pretty slick, very professional. Uh, the grant dollars paid for this. So we hired, I believe, the same group that did the agroforestry site. I have lost my thing here. So I am done anyway. So thank you all very much. My name is Liz Pringer, and I am a senior research specialist and PhD student in the Reward Lab, and I'm going to be giving you an update on our American elderberry breeding projects. American elderberry has been growing in popularity over the past several decades, and up until this point, most of the cultivars grown um, in the Midwest were selected from the wild. So what we are trying to do is to have a targeted breeding program. Um, to develop improved cultivars of American elderberry. This starts with selecting parents for desirable traits, crossing those parents, and then looking for those desirable traits in the offspring. And then once we've evaluated the offspring and identified um, potentials for cultivar release, we need to replicate them um, in yield trials regionally and locally. And then once we collect enough data, we can hopefully release a cultivar. Right now we're in the early stages of resource development and then population development. Right now we have more than 2000 open pollinated progeny in the field. So open pollinated means that we know the female parent, but we don't know where the pollen came from. However, um, the females are listed below and the pollen most likely came from these as well. We have additional open pollinated seeds germinating for next year. Some of the selection criteria we hope to use um, in evaluating the offspring are overall vigor, pest and disease resistance, uniformity, yield, um, berry size and quality, uh, resistance to shattering, and potentially others as well. Another thing that we are working on to help with the uh, breeding program is understanding floral phenology for popular cultivars. Um, some work on this has been done, but we are um, going to try to build on that understanding, uh, and this will take place next summer, um, and that'll help us assess timing compatibility between cultivars. And then we'll also want to make crosses to determine cross compatibility um, to facilitate future controlled crosses. And we'll do this using a collection of core cultivars that were planted in large pots for greenhouse use. And then another project we're working on to support breeding efforts is assembling a draft reference genome. So S. canadensis, American elderberry, um, cultivar Bob Gordon was sequenced with PAC bio technology, um, and we are in contact with the bioinformatics core, and they will be helping uh, with the initial assembly. So we have also confirmed the approximate genome size of Bob Gordon, and then referenced with uh, other uh, research that has already been done. And then eventually we'd like to use high c to resolve the assembly to the chromosome level. Hi, my name is Amanda. Today I'm going to share about Elderberry Project Report of 2022, conducted by me, Amanda Dwikarina, a PhD student, and uh, with my advisor, Dr. Chang Holin. American elderberry is Missouri's rapidly emerging new perennial crop, and it has been known that Missouri has been one of the leading producers of commercial scale elderberries in the United States. Elderberry also became popular in the U.S. as a remedy for treating cold and flu symptoms. It has been reported to contain high-level bioactive compounds with health benefit functions such as antimicrobial, antiviral, and anti-inflammatory. The objective of this project is to identify and characterize the bioactive compounds in elderberry juice. Second, to quantify the concentration of bioactive compounds across 21 cultivars of elderberry. 
and also to identify the antiviral activity mode of action of the elderberry compound. In our early metabolomic study, we have identified more than 150 bioactive compounds in 21 American elderberry cultivar. And then this heat map distribution shows that the relative intensity of the compounds of interest of across 21 cultivar. The darker the color red represent the higher intensity of the compound in the elderberries juice. This result can be a valuable re reference for producers or growers to design their breeding program since we have established the potential cultivar based on heat map distribution. Breeders can select cultivar based on this result depending on what products they are going to develop. Based on our early metabolomic finding, uh, we tested some of the bioactive compounds uh, using a high throughput assay. One of the interest results uh, when we are conducting an antiviral assay, we saw that seven out of 32 compounds were found to show significant inhibition of uh, NL4-3 virus and BAL virus, which is an HIV. Now, after we, sh we know several compounds from elderberry show, show promising bioactivity as an antivirus, further analysis is to elucidate elderberry compounds bioactive mechanism of action as an anti-influenza. This project is still under progress. Thank you. Good day. I am Isa Kupke. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Center of Agroforestry under the supervision of Professor Chung Ho Lin. The skin contains trillions of microorganisms that protects us from the external environment. However, when there's a dysbiosis in the skin microflora, this can result into more pathogenic strains of bacteria to flourish. This can result in maladies such as acne vulgaris, prosthetic implant infections, and chronic wounds. These four pathogenic bacteria are mostly responsible for these infections. And this can have long-term effects, such as pigmentation, scarring, and even death. Sambucus canadensis, also known as American elderberry, is native to North America and is used in traditional medicine to treat wounds and respiratory conditions. Missouri is the largest producer of culinary products from Sambucus canadensis. Current personal care products that is available on the market mostly use Sambucus nigra as the ingredient. Sambucus nigra is native to Europe, leaving Sambucus canadensis as an untapped American resource. Currently, there's no treatment available on the market for, from Sambucus canadensis for its cosmeceutical and pharmaceutical use. The objectives of the study was to identify the compounds in 21 cultivars of Sambucus canadensis and to determine their antibacterial, antioxidant, quorum sensing, biofilm, and virulent factor inhibition against single and multi-species bacterial systems and to determine if these samples can target pain and inflammation that is associated with acne, chronic wounds, and prosthetic implant infections. From 21 cultivars, 172 compounds were identified. 32 of these compounds were selected for further studies. These compounds had very good antioxidant and antibacterial activity that was comparable to their positive controls. We concluded that the compounds identified in Sambucus canadiensis um, had good antibacterial and antioxidant activity, making them good candidates for further in vitro and in vivo studies. Future studies will look at the antibacterial activity of these samples and determine if these samples can target inflammation, um, virulence release, and also biofilms that is contribute that contributes to antibiotic resistance of these diseases. 
The most active compounds will then be selected for further in vivo, human and animal studies. The goal of this project is then to transfer this knowledge back to the indigenous knowledge holders so that they can develop value added products that can benefit these communities and the country. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Hutchman. I'm a first year master's student here at the University of Missouri studying plant, insect, and microbial science. I'm under the direction of Andrew Thomas, who is located at the Southwest Reek in Mount Vernon, Missouri. I'm also part of the Reward Nut Breeding Lab. They do a lot of work out at the MU Hark Farm in New Franklin, Missouri. For my graduate research project, I am focusing on a weed management study in American elderberry. Uh, for my scope, this project aims to assess six methods of weed suppression in commercial production of American elderberry through analyzing weed pressure, elderberry production characteristics, and economic factors. The goal of this project is to elucidate an effective and practical weed management strategy for American elderberry producers that will maximize crop yields and minimize grower inputs. Elderberry are still considered to be a minor crop, but as they have increased um, in popularity, uh, commercial production has increased as well. So uh, with larger operations, producers have been faced with new challenges in weed management. Um, so the goal of this project is to answer some of their questions and provide some new solutions um, to weed management in American elderberry on a, on a commercial or larger production scale. Research sites I have two sites. Uh, one is at the MU Southwest Research Extension and Education Center in Mount Vernon, Missouri. That's the star on the bottom left. And then the MU Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Farm in New Franklin, Missouri. That one's up there in the center. That's only about 45 minutes uh, west of Columbia. I have 72 research plots per site. I have four plants per plot, six different uh, weed suppression treatments that I'm testing out. So I have a woven fabric, a white plastic, a wood chip mulch, a cover crop option, herbicide, and then a weed free um, control, which will serve as my baseline for comparison. Um, the cover crop option is more experimental than the other op than the other options. It has not been employed on a large scale yet. Um, but I'm trying it out. I think it could serve as a very viable option, um, incorporating the annual cover crops into the perennial production system with the American elderberry. I have three varieties for my study, Bob Gordon, Pocahontas, and Rogersville. Those are three pretty standard um, commercial varieties. And then I have four replications of each variety by treatment combination. So current progress um, establishment began in April of 2022. Uh, 2022 has been my establishment year. I have a woven fabric, white plastic wood chips and a cover crop treatment in place. Maintenance of herbicide and control treatments will begin in the spring of 2023 after um, everything is well established. So the picture on the left that was taken in August of 2022, I believe. Um, I, I had good establishment this year with my plants. Um, I replanted uh, later this fall um, and my replants did well as well on some of the plants that I lost. So data collection will begin in the summer of 2023. Um, I don't have any, any data yet, uh, but I have big plans on the data that I will collect um, during the summers of 2023 and 2024. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's about all I have for today. Uh, thank you all for listening and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello everyone, my name is Sydney Moore and I am a master's student under Andy Thomas and I'm going to be talking a little bit about my project today which is an elderberry genotype by environment study. So to start out a little bit about the project itself, um, we're aiming to quantify the performance of 12 American elderberries at five sites across four states um, and we're just hoping to get some information on how plant growth, health, and the berry quality itself is all affected by these differing environments. So um, again, we have different varieties. We have 12 total spanning all the way from Florida to Minnesota. And then in the middle there, we have Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Wisconsin. So we have 12 varieties from seven states. And then in this picture here, you can see me with one of my elderberries um, 
at the Hark Farm. I'll show you guys the different locations we have here in just a second. Um, but this is the Hamilton variety. And then, sorry, I realize this map is a little bit blurry now. Um, but I, like I said, I have five sites in four states. Um, our most northern site is managed by the Savannah Institute. It is located in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Also managed by Savannah, we have a site in Champaign, Illinois. Two sites that are managed by the university, one in New Franklin, which is at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center. Um, and then we also have one at the Southwest Reek in Mount Vernon. And then our most Southern site is the Kerr Center for Sustainable Agriculture in Poto, Oklahoma. So then this year, our main focus was on establishment at each of the sites. We did have hardwood cuttings, as you can see in this photo here. They were all propagated in the greenhouse at the Southwest Center. Um, and then they were propagated over winter and then they were planted this spring. So a little bit about what we've learned so far. Um, we've had a couple different just preliminary results. Um, the picture on the left there, you can see some aerified mite damage. Um, we have seen mites at a couple different of our sites, but we have one site that was pretty heavily affected. Um, and we have some information about that. We're going to treat that with a miticide. Um, but as well, we're hoping to see maybe some information on how those plants are affected by the mites um, at a different location. And then also in that bottom right hand corner, um, you can kind of compare it to the plant with the mites as well. You can see quite um, a distinct color difference, even in all three of the pictures, they're all pretty different colors. Um, so we're hoping to quantify that color difference um, and do some color analysis. And then lastly, that upper right hand, um, you can see one of our southern varieties in Wisconsin. Um, and the southern variety performance, even in the northern states, has been very, very good. Um, we are really curious to see how this plays out in the long run. Are those plants able to survive winter? Because as you can see, the top of that shoot is still pretty green and had not completely lignified. Um, so we're excited to see if that vigor um, comes back next year or if that um, growth is stunted by winter. So thank you so much for listening, you guys. Um, that's a little bit uh, about my project. If you guys have any questions, you are more than welcome to reach out to me anytime. Thank you so much for listening.